able to make it to get his own show, but that's why Dave Chappelle put him on. Uh, ask what do you think dude. about Chappelle getting attacked? Um, and does that make you worried? Uh, sometimes. Well, my material is mostly pharmacy related. So I don't have too many issues, but I've seen. I comics. think people are just stupid right now. Yeah, people, they're just looking for a reason to do something stupid. I think people are sensitive because yeah. I've seen people tell jokes where there'd be like a Jewish joke or something and the guy wanted to go on stage and, and fight the comic or just you know you say something that someone doesn't like like if you do gay jokes people before you could do gay jokes even if they're in good taste now people just get you're gonna be careful yeah just get super they sensitive. busted that dude up from Chappelle oh yeah that's you crazy. see pictures even, of him yeah his his, his all, yeah his shit look twisted up they didn't even press charge I think Dave Chappelle was mad about that day yeah, they didn't press charges. Yeah, I dude. think that's nuts. Yeah, that because you're publicly Joe Rogan said something about it. You're publicly displaying to to millions of people that you can commit an intentional violent crime, and there's not going to be any justice. Yeah. Dope. We're live. Another episode of Adversity King. So I got Maurice Shaw, right? Yes, sir. Let's go. So Doctor Shaw too. Uh, yes, you. I mean, you can just call me Maurice Shaw, but but do you have a PhD? Uh, I have a PharmD degree. Okay, so what's that? A f- so a pharmacy school, four year degree. Okay. Uh, before it used to, you didn't have to get a doctor degree. You, you yeah. Go for two years, but then they made it a four year program. So. So how'd you get into pharmacy? Um, to be honest, it was something my dad wanted me to do. I wanted to be a vet. Okay. But my dad was like, "No, you should be a pharmacist. Pharmacists make a lot of money. It's yeah. a good profession. You can help people." So. I was like, all right, I'm gonna just take the test just to, just to see. And then once I got in, I really couldn't yep. turn it down at that point. But I liked helping people, yeah. And I like science, so I just kind of went went with it. But it was really something that my dad kind of wanted me to pursue. Was he a pharmacist? No, he worked in a research lab. Yeah. Uh, but he worked with some pharmacists, and they kind of recommended the career path. So. Now, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Chicago. Okay. And what'd your mom do? Uh, my mom, she had a couple of different jobs. She worked at like Rush, Northwestern. Um, she did some billing and coding for the hospital. Okay. Who were you closest with growing up? Um, I'd probably say my mom I was probably closest with, but to be honest, they had to work so much. I kind of like was a loner. Did you have home. siblings or your only child? I was the only child. So. Okay. And what did, did you just, and then when did the passion start for science and veterinarian and everything? Uh, I always had a love for animals. I always had like newts, fish, uh, birds, cats. So I loved animals. And then just in school, I was always good at math and science. Now, what part of Chicago did you grow up in? Um, so I grew up in by Rogers Park. Okay. Um, so Where's I, that? Uh, by Evanston. Uh, I'm not from Chicago. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I I grew up north side of Chicago. So during the during my school year, we stayed up north with my parents. And then during the summertime, I didn't really have friends up north. All my friends lived on the south side of Chicago. Yep. So then I stayed with my grandparents now, uh, during that, the summer. Your your career choice at such a young age puts you in a sophisticated level, whereas I feel like a lot of – I think st- it's stereotyped that a lot of individual Chicago, it's more of like the gang banging. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's like did a lot of your friends you know, mix into the science or were you kind of like a hybrid where you could kind of like – more of a chameleon, I should say, where you could kind of adapt to different. Well, see, my parents, they, they, they made sure I never went to public school. They always put me in these private schools. Okay. So, like, I went to St. Ignatius High School. You have to test into that. Okay. And so, it was, I was kind of separated from my friends a yep. little bit, and which made me a little bit of a loner. So, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, you know, they did things, game bank, family members, cousins, they did. Yeah. But it was like kind of like two separate worlds because my parents made sure I was always so busy. I never had time to really yeah. dabble in any of that. Now, well, did you do any sports or anything extracurricular outside of? Uh, I played basketball up until eighth grade. We didn't have a basketball team. But in high school, I was really fat. Yeah. Uh, poor nutrition. We didn't have a lot of money. So I kind of ate whatever I could get, which yeah. was really unhealthy. So I uh, really just studied. I was really fat. It wasn't. It was funny. When I went to college, I lost a lot of weight. Yeah. So when we played basketball, I was super fast. And everybody at was. I went to University of Wisconsin. Yeah. And everybody's like, you're on the football team? I'm like, no. They're like, why don't you play football? I was like, I was fat most of my high school career. I yeah. I played sports. But when That's I went hilarious. to college, everybody thought I was there for football. So what was growing up for you like? What was some of like, your favorite memories or anything like that for growing up? Um, It's kind of weird now. I feel like, you know, 
as a kid back then, Chicago was different. Like, you know, my parents would go to work and they would give me like five bucks and I would just take the train and bus wherever I wanted to as a kid, go play basketball, yeah. go to the Y after school program. It wasn't, you know, now you worry about if your kid, if you're on the south side of Chicago catching the train where your kid gets shot in the drive yeah. by or just, it was a different world. So it was just kind of like, I love being able to just explore the city on my own and just, yeah. you know, do what I had to do. So when you're selecting colleges, how did you break down what college you not, did you do all four years at the University of Wisconsin? Uh, yes. And then what made you decide for the University of Wisconsin? Uh, <clears throat> well, I had an aunt. Um, she was dean of admissions there. She recommended the University of Wisconsin. When I went to Ignatius, uh, a lot of other people were going to Wisconsin. Um, so they have a good pharmaceutical program? Uh, well, that was just for undergrad. Okay. So that's where I just did my undergrad. I wanted to go there because my aunt was there. I could so get it's undergrad in. two years, right? Undergrad is four years. So and you get a bachelor's undergrad, and then you got to do another four years. For pharmacy, pharmacy. school. And so then you did that total. at the University of Illinois, right? I did that at Chicago State. Chicago University. State. Okay, yeah. that's right in Chicago then, I would imagine. Yes. And so side. which one did you like more? Um, it's kind of funny. that You know, University of Wisconsin versus Chicago State, they're – Different experience. I probably would say I liked the University of Wisconsin more because it changed my perspective on life. Yeah. Um, in what it, way? Uh, well, growing up in Chicago, my my perspective of what wealth was was way off. Like if somebody had a car, or flashy jewelry, I thought that was they were wealthy, rich. but yeah. they were living paycheck to paycheck. I went to Wisconsin and was hanging out with some of my white friends. You look at them, they you wouldn't think they had money. You go, they got a house here, a house there, yeah. boats, and then just like they spend a little differently. Yeah, it opened up my eyes yeah. that this is truly what wealth yes. is. This is what it takes to yeah. obtain wealth, not just having a car with rim. So it kind of really shaped shaped my life, helped me focus a little bit better. Yeah, um, really kind of drove me. It's like I really do want to become a pharmacist. I want to get my doctorate. I want to be. Uh, you know, successful. And I think, you know, going to Wisconsin, I also got the party too. Parents weren't there. Nobody yeah. could check on you. Yep. So that aspect was kind of cool. Meeting people that were completely different from me. Who was the coolest person you met at Wisconsin? Most unique, coolest person um, you met? Probably one of the coolest people I met because he's so down to earth was, uh, his name was Alondo Tucker. He played for Wisconsin. Yep. Um, he actually got drafted by the Suns. Yep. And when he got drafted, he let me stay at his house for a weekend. Still playing? Uh, he's not playing anymore. He he does more coaching, more raising his kids. But yep. just, you know, as as a black man, to yeah. see another black man that successful, see, to see yeah. his house, the car that he was driving, just the way he carried himself so professionally, it was kind of inspiring, to yeah. be honest. That's dope. So, and then as you train you transfer to the Chicago State? So, yeah, so I went to University of Wisconsin for four years. Graduated. I applied to pharmacy school at Wisconsin, but most of the students that they take, you have to be from um, the state of Wisconsin because okay. they don't want their far their state to be short of pharmacists. Okay. So I didn't get in my first time. So then uh, I applied the next year and I applied to Wisconsin and Chicago State. Yeah. And I was able to get into Chicago State. So I went okay. there for four years. So what was that experience like? Um, it was kind of different because University of Wisconsin is a big campus, Chicago yeah. State. It's a predominantly black institution yep. on the south side of Chicago. Not that big. And, you know, it's like completely different. You know, I, went, I remember one day I was in the library and there was like a rap battle going on. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have that at Wisconsin. That's hilarious. You know? But, you know, um, it was cool in, in, in the fact that um, a lot of people in my pharmacy school, they were like either Nigerian or Arab or different cultures. Chicago so, State? Yeah. Yeah. Because it was pharmacy program. So I was able to, you know, I have friends that are Muslim, that are yeah. Jewish, African. And I didn't really get that at Wisconsin. You know, most of my friends there were, were white. So yep. it just gave me like a different. The diversification down yeah. in the city. So what got you into stand? When did you get into stand up? Uh, I got into stand up when I was in. Um, when I was in pharmacy school, you know, people my whole life always told me that I was funny. I was always getting in trouble yeah. for being like the class clown. Yeah. So somebody's like, you should be a stand-up comedian. So one day I'm in pharmacy school while I was studying for my exam. I just decided to go to a random open mic in Naperville, yeah. the comedy shrine. And, um, you know, I did that. I was telling like your typical like dick jokes, being drunk, just yeah. stupid stuff. And, you know, when you go there, 
all the con- you know it's awesome because when you go to open mic it's a bunch of people just pursuing their dream yeah and it's something about the process of every week you and your friends get together trying out new jokes seeing if it's work trying to help each other just yeah. try to build your material over and over you kind of build a friendship kind of like a brotherhood of people chasing their dreams so i was doing these jokes and there was a guy named mel novitz um he he was a writer uh, for the tribune he's done a lot of other stuff uh on tv and he's like oh are you practicing your jokes and i was like no i'm actually studying i have a, a exam on heart failure tomorrow and he's like wait what i was like yeah i have an exam I'm, I'm in pharmacy school so he's like well why are you telling these other jokes i was like he's like you need to tell your story about being a pharmacist because that will separate make you. it organic yeah separate you from everybody else and first i didn't think that anybody wanted to hear jokes about being a pharmacist but yeah I kind of took his advice and kind of just did more pharmacy jokes. And I was getting booked more and more and more because people wanted to hear it. Cause it was different than talking about being drunk or smoking weed yeah. or doing shrooms. And it kind of created my own avenue. So I kind of stuck with it. So now how long have you been doing stand up then? Uh, let's see, probably on and off for 10 years. Cause after I went to Chicago state, you know, most pharmacists, they just work right away. So you go to Walgreens or CVS, but yeah. I actually got accepted. Uh, I did a one-year postdoctorate residency with the University of Iowa. Wow. So I ended up going there for a year yeah. to do some kind of, some type of specialty training. Was that your favorite work? Um, I think as a pharmacist it was yeah. because I had a lot of uh, autonomy. Like we like one day a week I ran a diabetes clinic where patients brought me their uh, diabetic logs, and I could change their medications. Like I didn't have to call the doctor to switch it. I could just do it myself. The way the clinic was so set how up. Expen- now, pharmacists, you handle insulin then. Mm-hmm. How expensive is insulin? I mean, insulin is, is very expensive. That's why they're passing a lot of laws to get it where it's no more than 100 bucks. Like, if you have insurance, you know, it's why is COVID? Why is the vaccine, essentially, is it free? And then insulin. Yeah, the government's insulin, paying for it. Well, why wouldn't it, like... Yeah, the insu- I mean... I'm yeah. not saying for it to be free. I, I really don't have enough political knowledge outside of... I just know how to sell insurance, so yeah. I, you know what I mean. So for me to, you know, for to add my two cents, it's not relevant, you know. But I'm curious. I'm always like, well, you know, these things pop up, and it's like Tylenol, this, and this is cheap, this, that, the, the third. It's like, you know, I look at these major things, the cancer treatment and insulin, and I'm like, yeah. Well, a lot of it has to do with um, t- depends on the market. A lot of times when these drugs come out, these companies are trying to make up for the cost of development of it. Yeah. So a lot of um, that take a lot of research, a lot of time. I did have a chemist on. We had a chemist named Will Blot, and he was explaining tenure and like how they have to raise money and grants and 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 different things like that. And then they they're trying to secure as a chemist, you're trying to secure your your position as a, a chem, like a chemist professor, and you raise your funding initially through research projects and things like that. Yeah, I mean, because, like, when you have exclusivity, when something's brand, you only have it so long. So yeah. a lot of companies are trying to make as much money as possible um, until things go generic. I know insulin is generic now. There's a lot of competition. But also things, you know, for demand, I mean, they could charge a lot of money for insulin because it's I mean, deadly, you, too. I mean, you, you need it. Yeah. I mean, I've had pharmacists because, you know, it's so busy. If you give out the wrong insulin. Come on, you can die. Yeah, you can you can kill somebody. Well, I'm, I've uh, met lifters that they'll take insulin and I don't understand how it works, but they'll take insulin to get, I don't know if it's bigger or more defined. I don't know, what is what is occurring with the insulin that it would cause somebody to increase muscle mass? Does it does it just break down sugar? I mean, insulin brings your sugar down. That's that's basically what it does. How would that make you gain more muscle? Would you know that? Um, that, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. If do you know, can... so it's just bringing the sugar levels? What do you know then about it? It just brings the sugar levels down? Yeah, so basically, you're, 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 normally your body produces insulin on its own, your okay. pancreas. So when you eat something, your blood sugar goes up. Your pancreas produces insulin. It brings your sugar down. A lot of people who have diabetes, they've lost, most of the time when you're diagnosed with diabetes, you just lost about 50% of your beta cell function. Those are the cells that produce insulin. So basically, insulin is just replacing what your pancreas would normally produce. That makes sense. It's it's essentially like your system is like half functioning. Yeah. For yeah. sugar regulation. Yeah. When you're, you Made, eat something. Yeah, but you, there's sugar in everything. People don't really. There's sugar in yeah, everything, literally. Carbs, whatever. You, it goes up. Your body normally brings it down. Yeah. But what happens is when you get overweight, 
you get insulin resistant. Your body is not as sensitive to the insulin, so your pancreas produces it, normally has a response. Now your pancreas has to work harder. What about the, is it type 1? Uh, it's not usually big. type 2. Type 1 is, is that's when usually when you get it, they used to call it like juvenile onset yeah. genetic, where your pancreas just stops working at a young age. Type 2 is usually your pancreas is. What about the birth uh, diet? I've heard of women getting... Uh, diabetes in the process of pregnancy. Yeah, yeah, that, that happens a lot. Uh, women's blood sugars go up; they get uh, diabetes during pregnancy. That usually after the birth of the baby, you after a month back. or so, that that go just kind of goes away. But yeah, type one is early onset diabetes. You usually get that as a juvenile. Type two is usually from being overweight. Uh, Are there any side effects from being insulin dependent for your life? Oh man, I mean. <laughs> I was joking. I were. I guess I wasn't joking, but I was talking to somebody the other day. I'd almost rather have HIV than diabetes. Diabetes is just one of those conditions. That it, it leads to. My dad had to have a kidney transplant because of his diabetes. It causes kidney issues, eye issues. Is it more predominantly? Does it more affect the African American culture? Because I know being mixed, like my my mom's always like, "Be careful with salt. Be careful with salt." Because uh, I know, like on my dad's side. Is it cholesterol? Would salt affect cholesterol or something like that? So, salt usually Sodium affects your, pe- your hypertension, your high blood high pressure. pressure. Yeah. Okay. And so she's always talking about that. Me, I'm just <laughs> salt on everything. Dog. A lot of it's cultural. Like Hispanics, they deal with diabetes a lot. Okay. When you, when you look at the food, it's the rice, the tortillas. A okay. lot of it is, is it affects our, you know black people and Hispanic more, but a lot of it has to do with the foods that we eat. So yep. um, a lot of it goes to education. Do you think we're at a disadvantage, though, because of... Uh, essentially, you know, I, it's almost like it's it is racially associated with Hispanics and African Americans. But at the same time, if you look at a majority of like, you know, our educational systems and our living situations, where it's I know there's assistance with, uh, with uh, you know, the the living situations with government assistance and things like that. But at the same time, when I look more at the, I, I listen to and I think of like what you were talking about with the educational system. Your parents shielded you to an extent where they they put you in a more um, productive, you know, educational system with private schools and things like that. And I actually went to a few Montessori schools before my parents went away. And then, but they, I had that foundation, you know what I mean? So I had like private schools and things like that, which I think somewhat excelled me in life. Whereas I look at like a majority of people, especially with African Americans and, and Hispanics, and it's not just them, They're, you know what I mean? They're white kids too. But uh, I, you just find it's like, I feel like 98% of the time you put kids in a in a foundationally bad spot specific to the education. And it's just, I feel like it's like nine times out of 10, they're going to be in a bad spot just with their overall health and then their life decisions. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think a lot of it It's has- like a broken system. I feel like, like we should attack the, the educational system and I think the health just goes hand in hand. You know, I feel like if we make people smarter, especially if we make black people smarter, you know what I mean? Like almost forcing it where it's like, we're going to put money into the educational system. Like where's the money go for, you know, these, these lower, lower income, uh, you know, living areas when it comes to Chicago, it's like, instead of like limiting guns, why don't we just, why don't we just dump a bunch of money into the educational system down there? Yeah. A, a lot of it, well, at least from a health standpoint, a lot of it comes down to social economics. I mean, you got to think like to eat to get a salad from Panera is probably like six, seven bucks. It's a special, but, but if you want to get something from McDonald's, they have the dollar menu, so it's a lot easier that, to get French fries, you know, a burger. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's like it, we charge all this money, we make all this money. You know, obviously, I know it's required. You know, they're, like you're talking about economically, it's required. There's a certain give and take, but it's like I've heard insulin being a thousand dollars or something per unit or whatever, and it's like. Why, why can't we try to readjust funds or things like this that we're making to stop advertising McDonald's in the hood and let's try to make, you know, like healthy food affordable, you know what I mean? Like make pharmacy great again. Like let's make healthy a uh, health, you know, great again as well to try to make health and education great again. I think that's two big things people miss out on. Like when I was in pharmacy school, I actually did a research. Uh, there's certain areas of Chicago, especially like predominantly on the south side, west side, predominantly African-American area. Uh, areas they're they're food deserts so if you want to go if you live on the south side of chicago depending on where you live if you want to go get healthy fresh produce you may have to travel 30 miles outside of where you live just to get to a store that actually has fresh produce so it's difficult for people to eat healthy because you know if you don't have a lot of money if you don't have a car 
have to take public transportation. You're not about to travel that far just to go get yeah lettuce and vegetables and healthy things like that. So a lot of that is trying to end a lot of these food deserts that we have. And even the people that can't afford it, I, I've been reading a lot on microplastics. Even the people that can't afford to eat healthy, there's microplastics. There's studies that show that there's microplastics that are essentially – a part of our everyday consumption, even even not even even not even ingested, but just through the different products we use, shampoos and things like that, and and uh, well, specifically, I guess the water bottles. You know what I mean? And it's like mm-hmm. these microplastics attack our endocrine systems, mm-hmm. and it's just ultimately just bad for your whole system. It's just bad for your health. You know what I mean? It's just we're consuming plastic, and so it's like even with the middle class and wealthier people, or they're we're just constantly surrounded by different chemicals and plastics. It's just no bueno. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's just not good. Yeah, like you were saying, social ec- even the educate. I think it's a lot to do with the social economic and the education. Because even me, I like I was telling you, I was overweight, and yeah. then I had to learn and I had to lose weight, and I lost weight. And the doctor's like, "Well, you know, you're in better shape now, but you still have high cholesterol." So I was eating eggs, a lot of eggs, because I was like, "Well, you know, you can die matter. and be ripped." You know yeah. what I mean? From poor health. So it's like your outside definitely reflects your internal decisions, but at the same time, there's unhealthy muscular defined individuals because Mm of not a proper balance. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's like you're eating too much eggs or like sometimes I'll go crazy with salt. You know what I mean? So it's like there's definitely, that's why I think people should do semi-annually, if not quarterly, that you should go get your blood work done and just check on like, what are your levels? It's kind of like, it's kind of like school. It's like we take tests and we grade ourselves to see where we need to improve. I mean, you're still, you're, you're supposed to go, you know, annually or semi well you know depending on what you have but at least annually to get every your- level though not just like oh you're good you're alive you know what i mean the doctors sometimes it's like everybody wants to wait and then put a band-aid on it it's like why weren't we more proactive you know and i want to get into like the vaccines and like their their uh, their efficiency and effectiveness with that is like what about the solution of being more proactive why are we waiting for and i know it's like it's so it's only so predictable of like when's the next pandemic when's the next virus this that the other but like, what can we do as a proactive solution opposed to waiting to let's throw a Band-Aid on it? You yeah. know, I mean, a lot of it just access to health care. I, I know a lot of people who have like state Medicaid insurance and they'll have a doctor and all of a sudden, you know, the doctor's like, we don't take Medicaid because, you know, Medicaid sometimes takes a long time to reimburse. So sometimes people won't take it. So then now these people who normally have one doctor has to figure out they have to find somebody else that will actually take Medicaid or yeah. sometimes, you know, you you hear some places they'll stop. We don't take Blue Cross Blue Shield anymore. Okay. Yep. Now all those people have to go find a new doctor. You gotta find someone else. Yeah, and so the way our health care system is kinda of set up it's Do you know of any other healthcare systems that you think are like doing better? I don't study any other nations, but I'm, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I don't know. Like I haven't really heard anything that sticks out where it's like, oh, that makes a lot more sense where we could just take that because i don't know it's like do we make it free for everybody do we you know what i mean i have no idea yeah, yeah that, that, i grew up in a broke ass home so like <laughs> you know i i would imagine like if something were absolutely terrible if like my sister my mom myself got like really sick growing up and we didn't have access to some type of health care like i had a lot of concussions you know my mom had me in football and things like that um had a surgery or two but like if we didn't have access to health care we would have been screwed. You yeah. know what I mean? So I don't know. Yeah, I don't like, I don't know if universal health care is better. So then that way, you know, everybody has health insurance and there's no excuse, but I don't, I know for everything that people say is positive, there's gotta be some downfalls to it. And yeah. I just don't know enough about it. Yeah. I have, I have zero idea too, you know, now with the, with the vaccines, um, obviously COVID is real. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I, I'm not, I, I, I don't politically associate myself with, with anything aside from if I do, it's with the well-being of mankind, of human beings. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. are you alive and happy and well? That's my political association. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like, are you happy? Are you well? Or are you not hurting other human beings? With with the vaccine and you distributing the vaccine, what rate, like, were you, like, at COVID's peak when COVID was occurring? Like, how did that all, like, come about? How did it all transpire? And, like, what rate, rate were you distributing vaccines? So, uh, so when COVID first hit, it was actually crazy because, um, we, in the beginning, we didn't have a vaccine and being a pharmacist, I still had to go to work. I was one of the people who still had to go to work. I used to have to, so you're, you were an essential. Yeah. I had to carry this piece of paper that says like, you were allowed to be out. Yep. You know, I was kind of nervous because you didn't know how serious it was. So, uh, in the beginning it was, it was just really nervous to, to, 
we didn't know if we were going to have a vaccine or not. We didn't know anything. And so when the vaccine came out, they did it in waves. Now, they were already in the process of developing mm -hmm. from what I've heard, because a lot of people were like, how they create a vaccine? That, you know what I mean? That's fake. But they were they, they, they're always working. Scientists mm -hmm. are always working. You know what I mean? To that, I guess that's kind of like that proactiveness. So it's like they were working on these general vaccines, the mRNA, right? Yeah, mRNA vaccine. See, normally, if you're working on a vaccine, you have limited funds, limited resources. Yes. But now it was just like, you know, all the money, all the They resources. probably put the most money yeah. in history into this. Into making this. So then that way they were able to just accelerate this process. Yes. I mean, if, if they wanted to, if there was something else that they wanted to work on and they got the type of funding and support to accelerate it, you know, other things could come out as quick. But when it first came out, they only gave it to people who were high risk. So... I was having to travel to like all over to these long term care facilities. Yep. So we were giving it to um, those people first. And it was kind of crazy because we had the Pfizer vaccine. So it was like, I remember it was me. I was given the vaccine. Then we had another pharmacist who just had to 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 mix it up, make sure it was stored because it had to be cold. And then we had somebody else to help give the shots. And like literally I'd be vaccinating like two, three hundred people just back to back giving shots in these long-term care facilities first yeah and uh I, I remember working for like eight hours with no break and like it was it was really it didn't have time to eat really you yeah know, taking the gloves on and off your hands are getting chapped and dry and yeah and, and you know it, it actually was a little bit scary when you were actually out there you know a lot of people just kind of had to wait at home and see but now with your hands-on experience were there more i mean obviously this is more of an obvious answer but negative results from the vaccine what did you see a lot of negative results like hey this doesn't feel good uh you know just your typical side effects from a vaccine like the sore arm yeah a lot of times people would get sick you know some people would get sick with the first shot normally so usually when you get something like a vaccine your body kind of gets the vaccine then says okay now i can recognize this because a so vaccine that's, that's is when people get sick when they get the second shot so a lot of times when people get the second shot, they complain and say, oh, man, my body aches. It's a dead um, copy of the virus, right? Or yeah. is it a live copy? No, it's, it's dead. It's not okay. like there's some vaccines that are alive, but this one was was dead. Like, okay. so, so if you were to get the first shot of the vaccine and felt really bad, it was more chances that you recently had COVID because your body already recognized it. Like, oh, OK, we just yeah. kind of fought this off. When you got sick your second time, that was usually a reaction from the first shot. A lot of times people think that's a negative effect. But that's actually a positive effect. Your body recognizes, like, hey, this shouldn't be here. Let, let's fight it. But that's when people get sick or some of the scares you hear on the news, people don't necessarily report that back t to the pharmacy. So I don't ever really yeah. hear about those. But I'm sure there's people who have had negative effects. Of they yeah, it goes both report, ways. Yeah. You know what I mean? Dying without it, dying with it. You know, so did you experience anybody dying with it? Uh, I, I personally didn't experience anybody okay. who. And See, I, reported it. on the personal experience now, what about people dying from COVID? Did you personally experience any of that? Um, no, I, I personally didn't. See, most of the that. people that I've, I've met, it's not, but I don't know that many people. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, you figure between you and I, we probably know a couple hundred people if we go through all every, everybody we know and things like that directly, indirectly. So, I mean, but, I had some, I had a good friend of mine. He was probably a year older than me. Uh, he actually died from COVID about a year ago. Oh, he did? Yeah, it was kind of shocking. Okay. Um, was he in good shape? He was. Yeah, he was in good shape. He was like a basketball coach. Wow. Um, you know, he had... Did he have any other pre-existing conditions or anything? Uh, not that I know of. I, I knew his brother because um, at one point I'd actually opened up a uh, barber college and I got funding to help uh, felons learn to trade a barbering for free. So, so do you cut to, hair too? No, I don't cut hair. I just kind of opened it up because what I was trying to do was try and create a health initiative, a black barbershop health initiative where you come to the barbershop, you get your hair cut, we check your blood pressure. If it's high, I worked with a, a hypertension specialist, an African-American doctor, Dr. Flack. He agreed to take them no matter what insurance they had. Yep. Um, they could go to him and he'd treat their blood pressure. So that's kind of why I opened up helped open up the shop because i wanted to do this health initiative but his brother went to the went to the school and we, we kind of grew up together so now back into diabetes does metformin work like insulin as well no uh insulin brings your uh blood sugars out metformin works differently your 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 liver produces sugar so metformin kind of tells your liver not to produce so much sugar and metformin also helps with weight loss to reduce that insulin resistance so they work 
different what if way. somebody didn't have diabetes and they wanted to lose weight so they started taking metformin could that potentially induce diabetic uh no that that wouldn't cause it i mean met, met, metformin would just you know help lower your blood sugar it wouldn't but it could why don't people just take metformin to lose weight uh, metformin actually has a lot of side effects so it actually causes a lot of diarrhea and gi side effects and, yep. and people have to be titrated on it you start with 500 milligrams take it for a while go up to a thousand max dose is 2000 milligrams but it, it actually has a lot of side effects so like a lot of these medicines when i look in patients profile one medicine causes this, it does good but also causes another side effect and then you end up taking something else for that side effect so if you're just trying to lose weight metformin isn't the option it's got too many side effects yeah it makes sense so i want to kind of jump all over the place here back into the stand-up comedy so it's 10 years on and off who kind of who have you looked up to the most in the uh comedy industry um i like paul mooney a lot so you have any specials on netflix um he doesn't have any on Netflix. He actually recently passed, but he used to write for like Richard Pryor. He was on uh, Dave Chappelle. I think I've Ask heard a Bl- of. He was like that Ask a Black dude. Yeah, was he black? Yeah, he was a black guy. Okay, uh, he wrote for Richard. Pryor. From where um, was Richard Pryor black? Why am I? Yeah, Richard dropping Pryor the ball was here. Black. Yeah, Richard. Pryor R- now Richard black. Pryor is like an OG for comedy because yeah. he gets a lot of creds from a lot of com- uh, comedians. Yeah, uh, Paul Mooney was one of those comedians that was behind the scenes. He wrote for a lot of famous people, but you wouldn't if you look at who. Uh, the credits you would you would see his name uh, the problem is to be honest a lot of his material he uh he talked about white people a lot and it was kind of real harsh so he never was able to make it to get his own show but that's why dave Chappelle put him on called Ask what, a what do you think dude. about Chappelle getting attacked um and does that make you worried uh sometimes well my material is mostly pharmacy related so i don't have too many issues but i've seen i comics. think people are just stupid right now yeah, they're just do, looking for a reason to do something stupid. I think people are sensitive because yeah. I've seen people tell jokes, whether it be like a Jewish joke or something, and the guy wanted to go on stage and, and fight the comic, or just you know, you say something that someone doesn't like. Like if you do gay jokes, people before you could do gay jokes, even if they're in good taste. Now people just get you're gonna be careful. Yeah, just get super. They sensitive. busted that dude up from Chappelle. Oh yeah, That's you crazy. see pictures even, of him? Yeah, his his. His all, yeah, his shit looked twisted up. They didn't even press charge. I think Dave Chappelle was mad about that. That you know. Yeah, they didn't press charges. Yeah. I he, think that's nuts. Yeah. That because like, you're publicly Joe Rogan said something about it. You're publicly displaying to to millions of people that you can commit an intentional violent crime and there's not gonna be any justice. Yeah, and didn't he have like a fake gun with a little knife? He in did. It? Yeah. He did, bro. And I think I heard Jamie Foxx like jumped up on him too. Yeah, I like even Dave Chappelle joke. Yeah, I was back there whipping a motherfucker's ass. I always wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of fun. But yeah, me me personally, I I don't know. When I'm on stage, maybe it's just you a big ego. dude though like, too. Yeah, if you come up stage, How tall are you? You got to uh, be 6, six feet. I was going to say you got to be at least 6 foot. I yeah, I'm a, like I'm gonna punch two. your ass in the face. Yeah, dude. I was like you <laughs> you, got, you, got, you, got, you got 250 behind a fist, dog. Yeah. So, somebody going to sleep. They better be big or or on on something for real. So, that's not. So, 10 years, what's the biggest gig you've ever done? Um probably like the I would say the probably the biggest gig is Probably when I'm at the Laugh Factory because the Laugh Factory holds between like three and four hundred people. Yep, and it's like back to back shows. Now, do you open or is it just a bunch of? Uh, so with the Laugh Factory, uh, it's a bunch of comedians. So okay, uh, so it's just like sets, like ten, fifteen, twenty minute sets. Yeah. Now, if I'm doing Zanies, usually that's like a headliner, um, and then I would feature or sometimes open. You know, um, like who's that. the biggest person you've opened for? Uh, or featured on? Let's see. There's Pat Tomasulo here. He's on TV WGN. Um, he's pretty big now. Um, I've over uh, Jamie Kennedy uh, on Christmas Eve. Yeah, I heard Jamie Kennedy. Um, those two are probably like the biggest. There's some other comics that I perform for that I think they're big comics, but they're not like big names. You yeah. Know, you know, Jackie Fabulous. She's been working a lot. You know, got. So is your favorite Pat Pat Mooney then? I like Pat just because I know him. I see him on WG, yep. and it's like the closest comedian that I know that I can touch. That I can see. He's actually performing this uh, week. He might be today or tomorrow, but he'll, he'll be at the Laugh Factory tonight. So that's why. And he's so like, he's so, in Chicago. Yeah, he's he's WGN. Pat How Thomas do we get Sula. him on the podcast? 
Uh, I'm sure he'd love to come on. Let's talk about getting this. I mean, he's yeah. an OG. Yeah. He writes for all these yeah, people. Get, yeah, get, get Pat Thomas soon. Uh, you should actually Google. He's got a comedy special he just put out. Last time I checked, had about 100,000 views. Yeah, dude, that'd be dope. Yeah, get him. He He's a great guy. Um, you know, sometimes when you meet with these comics, especially if you do well, you talk to them, like the headliners, you're like, hey, I'm just trying to further my career. I want to learn. They don't really want to talk to you, especially if your set was a little bit stronger than theirs. But Pat, you know. Down just, to earth. Yeah, down to earth guy, uh, nicest guy. I, I would say just reach out to him. Yeah, yeah, we're going to reach out to him for sure. So what's your favorite special then that you've watched? Um, I like a lot of Cat Williams. I saw Eddie Murphy. I watched this one he did in the 80s when he had that purple <laughs> sweat, sweat, purple, like, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That shit was hilarious. I didn't realize how funny Eddie Murphy was, bro. There's this comedian that I perform. His name is Justin uh, Ruppel. And he, he, he's a comedian. He does voiceovers. Yeah. And it's crazy. Like, if Mark Wahlberg messes up in Transformers, they pay him to redo Mark Wahlberg's voice. And it's like an insane amount of money. Yeah. But he's like, the gigs are so far in between. But he's like a voiceover person. And um, he does this Cat Williams bit. And he's this white Armenian dude. And he does the bit. He sounds just like Cat Williams. And so uh, he was telling the story about how one day Cat Williams was outside of the comedy club. And he hears him doing it. So he's doing his little Cat Williams bit. And he says, Cat Williams security guards came up to him and was like, hey, Cat wants to talk to you. He heard you, you know, imitating. So he goes out there. And he's like, Cat Williams is like, oh, it's a white motherfucker imitating me? Uh, this <laughs> Armenian motherfucker imitating me? I thought I was a black motherfucker. They got white boys imitating me now? And it was just funny telling uh, telling that story, <laughs> just meeting Cat Williams. But he's like, Cat Williams wanted, wanted him to, to pay him for part of his proceeds because he's imitating him. But... He was just joking, but it's just kind of... That's hilarious. Cat yeah, it's... Uh, what about... Now, what about you? And you don't have to share it. You know, I know how much work you guys put into your bits, but do you have a favorite bit that you have or, like, a one that you put out there, like, on, on social media that's already out uh, there? One that I, I kind of like that people relate to, where I talk about uh, being a pharmacist for Walgreens on the west side of Chicago. Yeah. And I was like, man, why I was working at a Walgreens on Roosevelt, home, west side of Chicago, dangerous neighborhood. But I thought it was kind of ironic because Walgreens supposed to be on the corner of Happy and Healthy. Yeah. This motherfucker was on the corner of Assault and Battery. <laughs> <laughs> so people like that because they relate. You know, they yeah. know the West Side is terrible and Walgreens is supposed to be on the corner of Happy and Healthy. So <laughs> That's hilarious. But, I mean, that's still a great place to put medicine. You know, it's a yeah. war zone sometimes yeah. down that way. So Yeah, it was, uh, you know, when I worked on uh, the West Side of Chicago, I actually had a technician that was murdered. Wow. Yeah, he was. Uh, it was crazy. He actually went to like this technician school. Yeah, and he 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 did his training, and the pharmacy manager was like, "Yo, you know, I really like you. I like to hire you. Can you start on Friday?" He's like, "Yeah, man, I'll start on Friday. Thank you, man. I appreciate." it. He goes, "You know what? Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you on Monday." He ended up getting killed on Saturday, and it kind of made the news. And like said, accidentally, or was he like involved? I, he, in he got group? he got into a art. I, from what I remember, he got into an argument with another guy over a girl, and he ended up getting murdered. But it was on the news, and they said a pharmacist had Damn. gotten killed. So my parents thought it was me because I was a black pharmacist yeah. working there. But he was really a technician. But yeah, it's sad. Yeah, technicians had to take off leave because, like, you know, they're. So where do you work now? Uh, now I actually work uh, for the state. I'm a pharmacist for now, the state. Now, is it contractual as a pharmacist? So, like, are you on a contract, or are um, you just. Pretty no, much it's, locked it's in. Salary, yeah. I mean, you can work as a contract, but I'm pretty much just locked in now. And then, so let's tie into your vision. Like, what, what, what do you see? What's your future then look like? What's your future vision then for yourself, just in general? Um, me personally, uh, I would love to continue what I'm doing. Uh, I would like to find ways to make uh, healthcare better, especially retail pharmacy. That's why I wear this hat. Retail pharmacy is. Yeah, what's your vision behind that then? Like, more details. Um, <clears throat> so, right now, Retail pharmacy staffs are stressed. You know, it, a lot of times, you know, I'd be working. We have to do six, 700 prescriptions. It's just me and maybe two other techs. And you're just filling prescriptions over and over. The phone's ringing off the hook. You're giving vaccines. I'm ringing people So there's not out. enough pharmacists. Well, there's enough pharmacists. There's actually too many pharmacists. There's enough pharmacists. They just don't give you enough help at retail. They cut the hours. So there's a lot of people making mistakes because you're stressed out. So if there's a, so what do you mean at retail? Is there there's not so enough like, helping hands? Right. So they don't give you enough hours. Basically, okay. they, they they the companies like CV. So they'll work like one pharmacist and then he'll have techs or hands. Yeah, normally before it'd be like if you were doing like let's say 600 prescriptions, you may have 
a pharmacist. You may have two technicians who are filling prescriptions, a tech to answer the phone, a tech at the out window, and yeah. someone at drive through. But now because they cut hours so much, it's just a pharmacist and like two techs. So the pharmacist has to type the prescriptions, review it, fill it, ring out the customers. You, you got people's lives in you. I mean, and then how liable are you? Like if um, you, you're very liable. So like, because I know doctors have to have insurance. So it's like as a pharmacist, like when you're prescribing and filling these orders, like someone dies, like how much of that falls on you? I mean, the companies that just throw you under the bus and say that you should. That's why there's this big outrage about how pharmacists are understaffed. If you, if you Google pharmacists understaffed, hundreds of articles will pop up. That's why I was in, you know. I've, I've been, I read your article. Yeah. Where can people, that's Tribune? Uh, yeah, that, uh, well, the, um. Just Google uh, the New York Times pharmacist New York being Times. understaffed. Okay. And, there, and there's plenty of articles. There's some articles I'm in. There's some articles where people have used my YouTube page to yep. hear the stories. Cause that's what I usually do. I, I post, you know, the horror stories of people being understaffed. People want, you know, people email me like I'm so Why stressed. Why would they understaff? To make more money, you know. You, but pe- the, the I, big it's it, horrible. I'm going to say people's lives are at stake, but nobody cares about anything for a dollar. To make a long story short i mean there's pbms pbms have reduced the reimbursement so a lot of now pharma- what's a pbm uh a pharmacy benefit manager they're like the middleman between the pharmacy the pharmacy and the insurance now are they the good guys or the bad guys they're the bad guys so a lot of times that's why so many independent pharma pharmacies have went out of business so no, let's say you buy uh a, a, a medication for a hundred bucks you know the the pharmacy buys it for a hundred they may be charged 12 bucks then they charge the insurance 112 bucks well the pbms what they've been doing is undercharging so the they'll just reimburse them 90 bucks so pharmacies aren't even making the acquisition cost of the drug and so what these what these pharmacy chains are doing to, the only thing that you can really change you can't really fix that but you can uh lower your labor costs so that's why they just keep lowering the amount of hours they give so they don't have to pay out because they're not getting real. A lot of the drugs that we fill, we lose money on. So the only way to make up is to increase volume. Just do more scripts, more scripts, more scripts, and cut back on labor. And then that way they can keep their profit margins. I've always found in personal experience, underpaid employees is the worst thing to have for profit margins. Because unsatisfied, like you're, you're, you know, they say the customer's always right, but as a business owner, Obviously, the customer that's purchasing your product or service is your customer, but truly your number one customer is your employees. Because if you have very happy employees, they're going to treat who in return very well, your customers. You know, mm-hmm. so it's like, it's really it's like the chicken before the egg, which one comes first. It's like a happy, a happy employee is going to tenfold your business opposed to you cutting the employee, whether it be their pay or just a lack of appreciation. You can pay somebody well and not appreciate them enough, and and it's still not necessarily being like a wealthy environment, like kind of like we what we opened up with. You know what I mean? Like there's a certain there's a certain dollar amount where people just aren't going to sell their souls and their happiness. Most people, where it's like they're not going to like allow somebody to talk, especially Chicago. You know what I mean? <laughs> they ain't going to allow you to talk to them or treat them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, in a actually, certain way. It's actually the pharmacy market changed. So when I started, there probably weren't enough pharmacists. Now there's too many because there's so many pharmacy schools. Yeah. So now these companies know there's, there's a lot of people who graduated pharmacy <laughs> school for a year and still can't find a job. So what do you think? What do you think the percentage is if you had to like roughly, cause I try to explain that to people as well when I'm trying to encourage them to get in sales. I'm like, you gotta be careful. You know, when, when you, when you put yourself in a position where you commit to, you know, an education that you're paying for, cause I show them the unemployment rate, the bachelor degree to a high school diploma is a 2% difference. You know what I mean? The, mm-hmm. the, from, that was a 2021 study I think I did. And it was a it was like 2.5% of high school diploma, you know, uh, individuals are unemployed opposed to like 4.7% individuals with a bachelor's degree or, or vice versa. You know what I mean? And it was like, it's 2% difference, you know? So it's like 2% more people are getting, are getting a position, but it's like, are you, are you willing to gamble that 2%? And then I'm like, then you got to factor in the average student loan debt's 30 grand. Mm-hmm. That's low. I feel like most people I talk to are way higher than that. And then it's like, all right, well, you got a 2% chance. you got a 100% chance you're going to have to pay that money because <laughs> you know them, the subsidized yeah. and unsubsidized loans. You know, so it's like the subsidized, you know, which one accrues immediately? Is it the subsidized? Uh, 
I think the unsubsidized okay, accrues me. immediately. So the interest rates are accruing immediately. You're building up this debt at a at a rapid rate that's just unaffordable, and then the then they then they underwork you, they underpay you, and then that's if you get the job. You know what I mean? Like some people would be great. It would be it would be a blessing to be underworked and underpaid if we could secure a job. Yeah. You know, as I always tell people, it's like be careful. I'm not. I would not let somebody work or operate on my on my you know physical being and. and a surgery or make any recommendations without a, a freaking degree. I'm not I never advocate for people not to go to school just because I didn't go to college, but I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm a dumb insurance salesman. You know what I mean? It's like, I tell you to buy life insurance, you know, it's like, there's nothing sophisticated to it. Well, I mean, like, for example, like when I was coming out of pharmacy school, it was easy to get a job paying $65 an hour. That's what I read in there. I was like, that's really good. Yeah. And, and now pharmacists coming out are, because there's so many now they're offering like forty six fifty dollars an hour, and you know they're not even giving you the amount of hours that like I would get forty. A lot of times it's just thirty. So if you're gonna go to pharmacy school, you're gonna get in all that debt from undergrad because you got to do the three to four years. Yep. And you go to pharmacy school another four years, you don't get a high enough pay or enough hours to pay it back. So it's really kind of pointless. But they know that there's too many pharmacists, so they can say, hey, we'll offer forty five because if you have student loans, you're gonna take whatever just to try to pay it back do they ever hit pharmacists with uh hey you need two years of experience or anything like that or no because you do four years of pharmacy school you're pretty protected um i mean now because so many people are applying for the positions they could look at people and say i mean it's not required but they could say hey i'll hire this person with two years experience versus somebody with no experience okay. because they could just have so many people but it's not yeah that makes sense but that, that's another thing i get like I try, I try to tell people, be careful. It's like, whatever you're selecting, be careful because, you know, it may not just be the degree that you're waiting for. They may want experience, too. So it's like, go get a four-year degree. Go have five years of experience. And it's like, and then and then that is if, you know, it'll be, you know, another pandemic occurs. What what if you're not essential? What what then? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what's going to happen, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think with this pandemic, top people a lot of people don't want to work they're just they're choosing happiness or you know before i feel like people would just keep working a job even yeah. if they weren't happy but now you learn that life is short and it's like you know i'd rather just be happy and maybe just take there's, a chance and work there's for definitely myself. some pros to the realization that it's brought but i'm i mean looking at our overall economy right now there's definitely a lot of cons too that are you know outweighing the pros huge advocate for people people's happiness happiness is wealth at the end of the day it's like are, are you happy with your life what you're doing where you're headed you know but but there's definitely like there's that balance of like happy or not like you know you need to like take care of your your needs mm -hmm. you know like i'm not not your wants and desires but like what do you need to eat you know what i mean you, you need to have some living type of space you know, like you, you, there's needs that need to be met. So it's like sometimes you definitely just got to sacrifice, you know, what you want for what you need. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah. That's so long-term vision, continue to do what you're doing now. Continue what I'm doing. Uh, I, w I would love if there's ever like a, a pharmacy show or something like that to be a part of that, to be a writer on that. Cause that's yeah. kind of just pharmacies has been my niche, you know, continue to build my YouTube, my YouTube channel. Um, you know, when I first started, I was trying to make videos just to let people know that, you know, pharmacy, we're being understaffed, we're overworked, like this is dangerous. You know, I was trying to speak out about the understaffing and it's funny. I was like the only person. Everybody was like, you better stop talking about it. And now it seems like that's what every news article is about, the understaffing and news news um, reporters or writers asking me about understaffing. And, yeah. you know, I ended up getting like, I have like two million views on my YouTube channel. I never thought that. Dude, that's really good. I never thought. Shout. What's the YouTube channel? RX Comedy. R. Oh my God, that sounds like that's <laughs> a you picked a perfect name. That sounds like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. It just sounds like already famous. Yeah, I mean, it's like for me, you know, there's a lot of YouTube channels. Like, I only have eighteen thousand, but for me, I remember when I first started, it's, I, I it's just seventeen thousand nine hundred ninety nine more than we have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like. You you guys have a better understanding of the time it takes for so to learn long. how to edit, 
the audio, especially shout watching, out Aiden, dude. Yeah, I was telling him you watch a YouTube video, learn how to edit. It takes them fifteen minutes to get to the point about how to just yeah you know, cut something. It just but you're scared to skip to which part because yeah. you're like you don't know where it's gonna be. Yeah, just the, the time it takes to to build it up, build your brand, keep everything. When you do it on your own to get like seventeen thousand subscribers, to me that feels like that's a huge hundred thousand. Yeah, you know, that is, like, dude. Yeah. That is for sure. It's crazy what some of these YouTube people make too. You know, you get up to like a million subscribers, they send you like a gold brick and like a hundred thousand dollars a month or something. I I don't know how the ads, I guess, but uh, but that's what that I mean. Like, comedy's changed before. Like, you know, you go to a comedy club, you perform, and then like these talent scouts, they're sitting there looking. For you but now you know you can perform all day that's what you said they're on youtube now youtube and tiktok looking for talent yeah now they do that so that's why i've kind of shifted from performing less on stage and just focusing more on my youtube channel. well you're, you gotta imagine your outreach you know what i mean you have a tiktok that blows up yeah you're talking about millions yeah. of people opposed to like you 300 400 people you know, at the Laugh Factory, it was yeah, like, really you millions. Know, you you make a you do the right TikTok, the right hashtag. You know, I have some TikToks. I'm like, oh, this is gonna take off, and that's like 800 people. Yeah, I know. It's, it's always the ones you least expect. Like I, we put up our best TikTok was the one with the chemist, and it's everybody freaking out about. He was talking about tenure, and it's I didn't realize all these nerds are on TikTok. It's like a bunch <laughs> of nerds like shut up pussy you don't know how tenure works <laughs> like flaming each other you know what i mean yeah, all yeah. these people in the comments are like you're co like and they're intelligent you know what i mean how many One, views did it get oh man I th it was organic it had to been two it's almost like three hundred thousand views or oh, something wow. and it's organic i'll put promo dollars into it so i got some that are a little bigger than that but i don't consider that completely organic because i'm putting promotional dollars into it yeah you can just click prom promote and just put a select a dollar amount and it'll force advertise it yeah, yeah so but i mean i mean these guys are you know, these are scientists like flaming each other and this one dude he's like i pray to the gods of science you dissolve and i was like <laughs> i don't know if i should like be worried laugh or like be like sad that i'm not this smart like these guys like just using the crazy i had to like research the language they're flaming each other and i'm like holy shit dude he's yeah i got a couple that's got a little over five hundred thousand, but that's it's dope like, it's like they hit five. It's funny because they hit five hundred thousand like in a couple days, and then they'll know? cruise. And then they just stay like, there. Yeah, just stay there. I'm like, damn, how did you get to five hundred thousand? And it just stuck. It just stuck. Just, yeah, like, stuck there. But yeah, that's why I love TikTok to be honest. Because like, if I post something on my YouTube or my Facebook page that has like twelve thousand people, it's like it only goes to really my subscribers unless yeah. I like pay for. It. But like TikTok, you can just hit a whole new audience without having it's dope any followers. So I really that's the best way to scale is to get on those new up and coming social medias that are on like Instagram has been out so long. It's kind of like the Facebook, you know yeah. what I mean? It's limited now. And it's, I, I don't know. There's so many algorithms and hoops to jump through. It's like, I, I just kind of use that as almost like a Facebook now just to update people in our industry. Well, I know comics have sold out shows using TikTok. They'll put up like, Oh yeah, I can imagine a little bit. And people are like, Oh, this guy's funny. Let's yeah. check it out. And you know, they're like, Hey man, I use TikTok to sell out my show. And yep. so I felt like people have, I don't know if people still have, but at least in the beginning, people were undervaluing TikTok. Like, there's I was, they, they, they I was, was for sure yeah. undervaluing. It really took me hiring a media team and getting Aiden to help help me. I mean, he does all my TikTok. He'll go on TikTok. He'll find comedians like you guys. So he does all of it. I mean, from running the podcast and things like that. So I just I just get on and sound dumb. Yeah, it's funny because people don't realize like, well, you should do this and do that. I was like, you know, when you're one person, don't have a team. I can't even imagine. <laughs> like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok is enough. They're like, you need to do Patreon or this or that. I'm I just can't like, imagine. I was like, I don't have the time. Like, well, you're one person. But yeah. It's just the people who, who don't do it. Like, I do a lot of, I have a green screen. So I remove the it's green dope. screen and I put up a pharmacy. And people are like, you should film this kit in the pharmacy. I was like, you know how long it takes to do the green screen, make sure yeah. the lighting's perfect because otherwise it looks shitty. And yeah. Remove it and fix the sound. Like, that shit, at least the editing takes a week. Oh, I couldn't the even imagine. The shooting is the quick part. I'm just yeah. like. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't even imagine. So, um, hobbies. Do you have any hobbies outside of comedy, pharmacy? Uh, really just the pharmacy. I mean, um the youtube because the social media just takes up so much time yep. it's hard to uh working out just trying to be healthier That's you like any like movies that. we're big into movies <clears throat> i love action movies but to be honest between work there's not and, much time yeah you know before i got big into uh facebook and youtube i used to go to movies all the time but yeah. it's like 
the more your channel grows and the more you want to put more content out is like the yep. other stuff that I used to love. Like, yep. I have to wait till it like comes on DVD or Blu-ray to see I it. try to incorporate, what did you say? Did you say DVD? I don't think people do DVDs anymore. <laughs> well, I'll see like, you know, I'll go to Best Buy. You know, it's funny. I went to Best Buy to go buy it. There's not DVDs D anymore. Yeah, they, they got a couple in the front. Like, yeah. just the movies that have come out. Like, yeah. I think the new Spider-Man. Okay. That well, I'm taking The Office. So I try to, that's the only thing I like. My only hobby is movies outside of work. So I'm take, but I, what I do is I incorporate work with movies. So I'll take, I'm taking like my top 10 people to go see the Doctor Strange here. Oh. one. Yeah, that'd be my type of genre. So I want to see Doctor Strange. I want to see the. I like the that's what we're being yeah, in Marvel it's just, it's just action, really Marvel. sci fi, like like the Avatar movie. They're coming out with a new Avatar. I'm excited for that. But uh, <laughs> DVDs, I haven't heard <laughs> that. But I grew up watching. Is it VHR? The VHS. VHS. Yeah, yeah. I grew up watching the VHS. I was born in the '90s. Yeah, so. you, could re you could record on those, and yep. it was just funny, like. That's what they had porn on. You had to. The v <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even imagine, yeah, dude. And I'm still wor I'm still like concerned on like who jacked off to a magazine. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I could see, but I'm just like, All that's the like boring. Stuck together. Yeah. yeah. Oh my, right, dude. Just, I, it's just weird. Like when I was growing up, if you tried to watch porn, you had the AOL dial up. Dude. So it was hard because you know it goes doo doo doo. <laughs> my dad's like, "What the fuck you doing in there?" Like he could tell like I was watching porn because he could hear that AOL dial up. <laughs> I think for like my tenth or eleventh birthday, my great grandfather tried to give me like 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 nude magazines, like some porno magazines. But he like snuck them into a bag to give them like and gave the bag to my mom, and she like looked through, and it was like this weird. But like weird you know what I mean yeah like, he like tried to give me like some old used underwear and like just what just like, some white like shit. trying to get porn <laughs> or a mad porn magazine it, it was hard back then like now you just go to the website but if you uh, wanted uh, porn yeah. you had to like god I gotta find someone else to go buy this magazine yeah find someone else to buy this tape but yeah times have uh definitely changed yeah I can't even imagine what about food do you have any favorite restaurants um <clears throat> no you know I've actually been on this like trying to cut my carbs out and just, you know, my mom's currently, she's battling cancer. So I'm trying to eat wow. a lot of stuff with antioxidants and, you know, prayers. I, I, yeah. Thank you. Like yep. I'm just reading like things that you think is healthy. Like you'll get some stuff that's frozen. You're like, Oh, it's healthy. But you know, to preserve it, they put a lot of sodium in it. Yep. And it's got a lot of salt in it. So really just trying to uh, eat more organic food, try to just be more clean. So, Actually, grocery shopping is taking a lot more time. Cause Dude, it takes we, a lot. Of time. <laughs> you're yeah. trying to eat fresh, and even when you meal prep, like that's so. a great way to like develop your character is to go grocery shopping because it it's gonna test your character. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be so many special people at a grocery store, and it's gonna test your patience, and you're gonna have to really just like pray not to rip someone's head off. You know, like yeah. between grocery shopping and driving in Chicago, yeah, great ways to grow your. I game. mean, when you work at a pharmacy and you see people, oh, I can't even imagine uh, forty years old with a cane and just overweight and just all it's just taking all these pills. I'm just like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to live like yeah, that. no, not yeah. at all, not at all. Even with the vitamins, I sometimes get like worried because I'm like, this all gets processed through my liver. I think you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, even though this is good and I'm taking vitamins, I'm just like. I mean, a lot of vitamins are water soluble, you know. You but I still think if it's getting processed through, I don't know. Yeah, like a lot, like the vitamin C, like that just water soluble. You you take too much vitamin C, you pull it, you piss it out. I mean, anything in you know in moderation. Yeah. But it, I mean, any vitamin that you get over the counter, I mean. It's pretty but much I just think of like our ancestors, and I'm like, they're just ten times healthier than us, and well, it was just all from the food. I think their diet was probably. A wider variety so they're getting a little bit of everything we're, yeah we're, we're, we're but i feel like they didn't have as much carbs like far, real far back it was probably just like probably just i think if they meat, ate the plants same, and fruits but if you if you had to think about it like i'm sure like the early americans they put potatoes they probably just didn't fry oh them. i'm talking like i'm talking like oh you mean like almost the, like caveman like, okay oh, like, yeah. almost like jesus time kate like kind of around there where it's like but even Jesus broke the bread, so it's like, I don't know, Jesus was on them carbs, y'all. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's just healthy carbs, because they probably ate a lot of fruit. I eat rice every day. I got a nutritionist, so I recommend, if people can afford it, I recommend, I always recommend if you can, invest into somebody, What if it's, it doesn't have to always be monetary, but look for somebody that's doing great or excellent in the area that, that you want to, 
you know what I mean, you want to dive into. If it's eating, if it's fucking golfing, just mm -hmm. get a get a coach opposed to just Google it. You can Google and figure it out. But, like, start there, you know, but I definitely get I, – I'm a huge it's advocate quicker. of getting a coach. If you do it on your own and try to learn, it, it takes a, a long time because yeah. you got to weed out the bullshit and – Stuff that like you I, got, that's not the it goes advice. back to like the media like you're i mean you're i can't imagine like all the talent and everything you've developed over being able to you know produce all your own stuff where it's like again it's like investing into the media account like with aiden and then and then his uh his manager it's like i, I invest a lot of money into them but it's also saving me 40 70 probably 100 hours a month honestly if not if not more because we drop two a week Mm -hmm. They edit all these. They pull out two, three highlights. There's other posts. He'll come in and record. It's probably hundreds of hours. I'm over here like, sh sh <laughs> <laughs> but I can't even imagine. I'm like, definitely, and 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 really, for most people, it's like just just find a way to to definitely start though. Yeah, definitely just start. Regardless, start start with something. But anything else on your mind? We're an hour in. Uh, no man. Well, Things I, to I mean, shout out. Uh, um, probably just shout out my YouTube channel. Um, you need to shout out our YouTube <laughs> 18,000. <000. laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I'll uh, shout out you guys, too. Just, um, you know, I really I really like uh, what you guys have set up here. Um, I think what you're I doing. I like it nonchalant. You know, I, like, I, I think the thing for me is, like, I don't care if this shit blows up. I'm really big on, like, you mentioned uh, kind of mid, midway through in regard to the different cultures uh, down in Chicago when you studied there for your pharmaceutical degree. And... I really find myself outside of movies just I like to shut off and listen mm -hmm. and just kind of like just get different backgrounds. Every individual has a different background, regardless of the Muslim, Jew, Christian, you know, black, white, purple. It don't matter. A every human being has a different background. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of like to learn like that background and then into the present and then kind of the the future of like, where do you want to go? You know what I mean? Like, what's the vision and wherever it's taking you, you know, I think it's really, it's really for me, it's really fulfilling, you mm -hmm. know, just to sit back and, and it gives you a lot of perspective. I think it helps me grow as a, as a human, uh, to sit back and have these conversations and just be like, that gives me new perspective on, you know, on COVID, the vaccines and things like that. Whereas a lot of people, you know, I don't think it's, you know, I don't know if people think they're cool or something where they're really set in one way mm -hmm. uh you know I, if anything i think it's foolishness to be so stubborn that you're not open-minded i'm mm -hmm. a very open-minded person you know what i mean like i'm not looking to be right i'm looking to get like we like to say in the business you know, I, i'm not looking to be right i'm looking to get paid yeah. you know i'm just looking for the best possible solution like what works the best doesn't need to come from my mouth you know so i think that's what what i like most about hopefully what I'm trying to accomplish here with the podcast. Everybody got a fucking podcast. So, Hey man, I mean, it's all about just repetition and, yes. and you know, just keep doing it, keep doing it. You get different people. And the more you do podcasts, you meet different people. Like you might've never thought about having Pat Thomas no. on there. And then now you're going to go Google him. Like, Oh my God, it's fucking Pat Thomasulo. You know, you yeah. see who he is. Oh, he's on WG and all oh, his thing is a hundred thousand views. And then when you reach out to him, just, uh, a great guy and so yeah. you know hopefully i hope that uh it all works out and he can yeah. come on here but it's just like just keep doing it keep networking you know like every time i've done a show a lot of times like oh my god i don't want to do this show I'm yeah i'm tired i know i'm always it's like a, man i'm so like, tired i didn't eat i'm walking back yeah. here i'm like oh shit some one of my one of my uh one of my guys i guess was out in the parking lot arguing with somebody and i'm like <laughs> i hope they don't get into a because they're from chicago my god like, i hope that doesn't turn into a shooting yeah <laughs> But you never know, cause I like I'll do a comedy show, and someone's like, "Hey, man, I know so and so. You should do this show." Yeah. And a lot of times, it's like even though I'm like, okay, there's there's times where I've done comedy shows, and it's only that person right there. Literally, <laughs> yeah. I've run meetings like that. You know what I mean? And I'm like, and I always tell everybody, it's like whether there's a thousand people, you know, in 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 our, cause we're a sales company, we were looking to recruit. You know, it's a thousand people or one one person. I'm gonna show up, give my best attitude, give my best effort, and we're gonna rock rock with what we can control. I always thought that being a, uh, a, a 
pharmacist would make me a better comedian because that's how I got all my material and it was unique. But really, I learned that being a stand-up comedian made me a better pharmacist because, you know, there'd be volatile situations where the customer's upset. Yeah. Like, a lady cussed me out like, you motherfuckers ain't shit. You just make a joke out and of I'm it. And I'm like, yeah, tell me how you really feel, Mrs. Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> and she'll start laughing. Yeah. You know, it just, because I was, you know, as a, I was also a pharmacy manager, so I was in charge of, like, three other pharmacists at 16 employees. Yeah. We were doing, like, 800 prescriptions a day. And so being able to talk to people, to be able to make people laugh, I was able to, like, help my coworkers. They enjoyed working for me. So yeah. many people were like, can I transfer to your store? I want to work for you. My fellow pharmacists, they wanted to work for me. The customers, they liked working yeah. for me. And, you know, when I got fired, they were all upset. And so it's just, it really was the opposite. Being a pharmacist, being a um, comedian just really made me a better pharmacist. Now, I'd like to wrap up with adversity. You know, name of the, name of the game is Adversity Kings. So, uh, and that's just everybody and anybody, you know, taking authority, not just uh, the male association with King, but anybody taking authority over the adversity they've faced in their life. What's the hardest adversity you've ever faced? Um... I'd probably say the hardest adversity is, um, that's a really good question. Um, really, when I think back on it, just trying to become a comedian, really. Because, you know, pharmacy school is really hard and you struggle. I've heard comedian is one of the hardest things to do. Because, like, I knew that pharmacy school was going to be hard. You know, I was at Wisconsin. I had to work three jobs, you know, just to get through to pay all the bills. Yeah. I was always studying. When my friends were partying, I was at the library, you know. Yeah. And then when I went to pharmacy school, it was a struggle, you know, because you're every other, you know, Tuesday is a heart failure exam. Then on Friday, you're doing a, an exam on kidney failure. And, you know, my dad, he had a. He actually ended up having kidney failure, so yeah. I was taking him to dialysis, going back and forth to pharmacy school, um, trying to do that. So that was hard, but I always knew it. It's just as long as if I kept doing it, that I was going to be able to get a job and I'll make it. Comedy, I can't tell you how many times I, you know, I perform at the Laugh Factory now, but for two years, every Wednesday, I used to sit out for three hours in front of the Laugh Factory waiting for the open mic just to do two minutes, just to show them what I had, and I did that over and over for two years before they even let me perform. And, so, and that's without any compensation. Right. No compensation. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the road, you know, hey, do a show. And, you know, I was working for Funny Business. They'd be like, hey, go do a show in Michigan for 100 bucks, no hotel. You know, I got to drive all the way to Mich somewhere in Michigan, do a show, don't get paid. So you're doing all this. You're taking a lot of time away. You yeah. know, time is more valuable than money because you don't get that back. And yep. there's, I'm, I may never make it. You know, yeah, you 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 you're working so hard for something that may never happen. I'd rather live my life knowing that you do. I tried my best and I just it just wasn't meant to be. Versus, like, damn, what if I would have worked a little? And bit I harder? think I think that's the making it. You know, because I think, you know, I think we get as humans we get to define uh, terminology and certain things in our own ways based off perception. I think how you perceive what you perceive is the reality, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I I try to tell people, you know, you making it isn't a destination; it's the process. Mm -hmm. You've made it when you wake up and decide I'm gonna go again today, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of who punched me in the mouth, what life did to me yesterday, who died, who's gonna die, what's gonna happen, all these negative adversities. You made it when you woke up and decided today I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep fighting. I'm gonna keep pushing, no matter what. Mm -hmm. No matter who says what to me, no matter what knows I face, no matter what challenges, tribulations, trials, and adversity I go through, today I'm going another day. I don't know what's coming tomorrow. I don't know if I'll even see tomorrow. But today, I'm alive, I'm breathing, I'm fighting another day. That's making it. It's not millions and billions of dollars because millionaires and billionaires commit suicide just like, you know, mm -hmm. just like the homeless person, you know? So it's like... Making it is, it's a, it's a heart decision every day from my perception and definition of making it. So that's what I love that because I'm thinking to myself, like you, you made it today. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You made it yesterday and then tomorrow you get to make it too. If we make it to tomorrow and we make the decision to go another day, we made it. You know what I mean? I'm rich. I made it. Uh, that's for me. That's like, that's wealth. That's the glory is in, is in the battle. 
Yeah, like when I first started my YouTube channel, when I had the only subscriber was my mom. Like, right, I always tell people, yes. It's just your mom. I would have never thought I would have gotten so many views on my platform that. And how long have you been would, doing it? Uh, my Your YouTube. I, my YouTube, I probably, well, I had YouTube for a while, but I never really. But like used, actively doing it. Probably about four to five years. Dude, and that's four or five years. Well, imagine four or five years from now with the compound interest of the persistency and everything you're doing, bro. It's going to be hundreds of thousands. Yeah, I remember when um, uh, I, had, I had got terminated for doing comedy and um, this guy, his name is Z Dog MD. He has like two million followers. He's this doctor. You should listen to him. He'll talk about vaccines yeah. and all this different stuff and he has all these followers and it, it's, it's crazy how much he, he just from this Facebook alone, you know, this doctor, he doesn't even practice anymore because he wow. makes so much from his social media. Yeah. I think just looking at his page and what he's done, I think you guys can really learn a lot from that. Not that what you're doing yeah. isn't great, but no, you got to always yeah, learn. Yeah. And I did a podcast with him right about after I got fired for doing the comedy, we were just talking about other things. And then I really didn't know how big he was. He just was like, hey, let's do this podcast. Next thing I know, the thing has like a million views almost. Wow. I've got pharmacists from uh, Australia reaching out to me, from China, physicians, wow. pharmacists from all these different states just reaching out to me like, hey, I just saw you on Z Dog MD. And it's wow. just crazy. I never thought, you know, what if I had given up a long time ago or didn't, yeah. you know, work on my channel yeah. or if I just stopped doing it? And it's just wow. like, you just never know. Just one day, something like that could just make or break your page and, and who you are and exactly how I got the job I, I have today because somebody saw my story and yeah. what happened was like, hey, this sounds like a great uh, pharmacist. Let's hire yeah. him. And now I have a dream job, you know. I That's was awesome, retail dude. pharmacy because yeah. it was a struggle, but now the job I have, I I, I wouldn't Let's go. change for anything in the world. So This was dope. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Absolutely. So Maurice Shaw again, everybody. And you guys can find him also on YouTube, RX Comedy. Yes. What about Instagram? Uh, Instagram, Doctor of Comedy. I'm gonna... My Facebook page is also RX Comedy. So let's see, Doctor D R O F yeah. Comedy. Yeah. So let's go. Yep, Marie Shaw, Doctor of Comedy. Check that out, guys. Anything else they can check out? They can check out MarieShaw.com. Uh, yep, yep. That, that's about it. Cool. Just go on there. Dope. All right, guys. Another episode in the books. Thank you again, Maurice, for hopping on. And it was uh, humbling just for you to come on. I know you've done way bigger shows, so this was dope to have you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man. My pleasure. My man. Uh.